So I want to welcome everybody, whether you're joining in live tonight with us or are viewing the recording later. My name is Mary Newton, and I'm the president of the Reading League Wisconsin. And tonight, we're pleased to provide you with an introductory tour of the new Wisconsin Dyslexia Roadmap. And we have as our guests tonight three of the contributors to the roadmap, Dorothy Morrison, Nancy Dressel, and Nikki McLaughlin. Dorothy holds a PhD in educational psychology and is retired as the director of the Ohio State University Reading Clinic. She's a certified master trainer for Orton Gillingham International, a literacy coach in the Webster Wisconsin School District and founder of the Eagle Point Educational Consulting Business. Dorothy served on the advisory committee for the Wisconsin Informational Guidebook on Dyslexia and Related Conditions and is, on the, is, and is on the board of directors of both the Reading League Wisconsin and the Wisconsin branch of the International Dyslexia Association. If I can just remind all of our participants to please, um, please mute your mics. We've got a lot of feedback going on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nancy has worked in many different positions in K through 12 schools and is a former school board member. Uh, Jacqueline, Jacqueline, can you, um, Jacqueline, can you mute your mic? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start over with Nancy. Nancy has worked in many different positions in K through 12 schools in Wisconsin and is a former school board member in the Somerset, Wisconsin School District. She served both on the 2018 Joint Legislative Study Committee on the identification and management of dyslexia, and also on the advisory committee for the Wisconsin Informational Guidebook on Dyslexia and Related Conditions. Nancy is the co-founder is the founder of NB Group Educational Coaching and Consulting, and a board member of the Literacy Task Force of Wisconsin. And then we have Nikki McLaughlin. Nikki is an author and technical writer who formerly worked for Epic Systems Corporation in Verona. She holds a structured literacy certification from the Learn Up Centers, and she homeschools and tutors. So as we move through the evening, please, um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box, and then we will answer them as time permits. We're probably going to hold the questions until the end um, and then see how many we can address. At the end of the meeting, I'll be posting a link in the chat box for you to request a certificate of attendance if you would like one, and those will be emailed out tomorrow. We are recording this meeting and we will post the <coughs> video on our YouTube channel. <coughs> so please keep your mics muted as we go through um, the evening and the special, re special request for me, please keep your fingers crossed for no internet outages. I've been living, oh, in, <laughs> living in an much. internet outage area. Um, so now let's uh, let's start our tour. We are going to start out with a little background, um, and I'd like to start with Dorothy, aka Dot. Uh, <laughs> Dorothy is the one who came up with the idea to create a dyslexia roadmap from Wisconsin. So Dorothy, can you tell us how you how you decided that this would be a good idea and how you organized the process? Sure. Thank you, Mary. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you and the Reading League for hosting this webinar and uh, the support that the Reading League has given this project has just been wonderful. We're very grateful. Okay, so the idea for the roadmap came from Ohio. I spent 14 years at Ohio State University. I had many friends there. Uh, I developed many friendships within the dyslexia community there. And we had a lot of the kids with dyslexia in our reading clinic. Uh, this group in Ohio came up with the Ohio Dyslexia Roadmap, and they sent it to me for comments, and I took the roadmap to the leaders in our state, Decoding Dyslexia, uh, IDA, Literacy Task Force, the Reading League, and I said, what do you think about this? Could we do something like this for Wisconsin? And they were wow. very very supportive but there i mean i'm just watching it oh, yeah. 
we've got we've got somebody needs to mute <laughs> somebody's talking over me thank you guys uh, okay so we put out an email to uh, members of these groups and other people and we said we need some volunteers we'd like to create a roadmap for wisconsin we had nine volunteers who showed up and for various reasons part of the way through some of them had to drop out some of them stayed longer than others but every single person contributed something to this roadmap and we're very grateful for that so let's go to the next slide uh, oh uh, okay sorry nancy i went too fast there we also went to some of the different guidebooks of different states to see what they had included uh, we have the wisconsin dyslexia guidebook but we put uh, we 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 looked at these others as well so we did some pretty thorough research as we tried to pull this together. We tried to create a document that appealed to parents, to professionals, to researchers, to just about any audience, administrators, leaders, school leaders, reading specialists, teachers, any audience that would want to uh, know more about dyslexia. So this was designed to empower Wisconsin to basically understand dyslexia, to embrace it, to understand what it is, what it isn't, uh, to create active learning environments in the schools at all levels for all of our dyslexic children and work environments. Nancy will mention later some of the problems that she had in work environments and to achieve equity through literacy. Equity and literacy are typically thought of in terms of minority populations, but dyslexics are a neurobiological minority in the schools. And we also need to consider equity for them. So with that being said, uh, yeah, I think we'll skip over that part. So Nancy. So I, just, oh. I wanted to um, jump in here for just a sec. Um, so we want to, I, I, what I'm really interested in is how these three ladies um, decided to become involved in this project. What was their motivation to spend all this time on this for the past year? So it would just kind of go one by one. We'll start with Nancy. And if you could just tell us what's your, what are your professional or academic or personal reasons for wanting to participate in this project. Nancy? Yes, absolutely. Um, I just wanna, everyone can hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so yes, uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Mary and the bio. Um, I have spent 20 years working in education in multiple different roles and they were always from a place of uh, leadership and system structures. And I've always been an advocate. I served on school boards and now serve on two different nonprofit boards. And so um, my experience in education and then my uh, advocacy definitely drove my inspiration to, to participate in the roadmap. But I think my greatest inspiration comes from the fact that I'm severely dyslexic myself. So my oral language comprehension is very high. It's above average. My reading comprehension is average. Um, however, my, my reading fluency is in the fourth percentile, which means that 96% of adults um, can read more accurately and quickly than I'm able to. And my phonological processing is actually in the first percentile, which means that 99% of other uh, human beings my age um, can, can manipulate sounds as they're reading and spelling and speaking. Um, more accurately and automatically than I'm able to. And um, there are many times in my life that dyslexia has been a superpower and a strength for me. And there are also other times that it has been disabling um, and it's genetic. So two of my kids are, of my three kids are also dyslexic. And so I definitely have personal reasons to um, advocate for 
all students to have access to quality um, reading instruction and assessment, but particularly for dyslexic individuals to be included in that. And how about Nikki? What's behind your, what was your, uh, what, were, what was driving you to become an active participant in this? Well, hello. Uh, and can you hear me fine? Yep. Looks good. All right. Um, so I, I was able to read really easily. It's from a child on, and I ended up getting my master's in ABD at UW-Madison. So for me, education has been a huge part of my life. Um, and then I was a team leader and technical writer at Epic for six years. So very much in the professional world. And when I had my kids, I decided I wanted to stay home with them and help them grow and learn. So I was a stay-at-home mom for a while, I sent them to school and I became an advocate too because I joined the PTO. So I was at a school with kids who, um, who had a lot of need. It was, it was a Title I school. And as a PTO president, I was able to do a lot. And then I found out my first grade son wasn't learning to read. Um, and reading has been so important to me my whole life that I couldn't even imagine what that was going to mean. So I, I kind of panicked and I studied up myself to learn how I could potentially help him. And I remembered that my sister had been diagnosed as dyslexic at age 17 and she never did get that help until she tried to get into college. Um, so for me, it's also personal because of my, my child. Um, and I learned to work with him. And then I ended up getting certified through Learn Up on the Tatum's, um, Tatum Tutoring program and now I do tutor other kids and when I found out this group was getting together to bring together resources that would be useful to other folks and potentially help more people I I really wanted to help out um, to the extent that I can. Thanks Nikki and how about you Dorothy? Uh, I want to share a story with you shortly after I arrived at Ohio State and began my work as the director of the reading clinic there. We had a little 10-year-old girl who had been diagnosed with dyslexia. We were working with her. And one day, her mother came to the clinic and said that this child would not be there because she was in the hospital on suicide watch. The mother broke down, started to sob. I went around my desk. And I helped her. She was a single mother. She had no resources. We were her best hope to help her child. But the schools were totally unsympathetic. They didn't understand dyslexia. They didn't know what to do with this child. She was receiving interventions that were not appropriate for her. And it was a pretty desperate situation. This experience early in my career at Ohio State touched my heart so deeply that I resolved then and there that I would do everything I could to help parents who might not be able to afford a neuropsych evaluation or expensive tutors, that I would do everything I possibly could to help these kids so that they didn't have to suffer like this little girl suffered. I think that's a pretty common, um, common route into this kind of advocacy that a lot of us have had, either children we've been working with or our own children, um, and kind of leads us in this direction. Um, not all of you probably know this, but um, if you're not from Wisconsin, <laughs> um, Wisconsin has another uh, resource uh, about dyslexia, and that is the Wisconsin Informational Guidebook on Dyslexia and Related condition, uh, Conditions. It was published recently by our Department of Public Instruction. Um, it was uh, part of a mandate from some legislation that came through a couple of years ago. And so there is that guidebook. And I'm just wondering, uh, maybe Nancy, you could start and talk a little bit about how is, how is this roadmap different from that guidebook and how does does it add something to it or how is it how is it related to to the guidebook that what that dpi put out so um as you mentioned earlier in our bios um i've had the gift of being involved in this process since the um, study committee started in 2018 
and Act 86, which um, mandated the creation of the uh, informational guidebook came out of that study committee. Um, and then Dot and I both had the opportunity to serve on the advisory committee uh, for the guidebook and now had the opportunity to author this uh, independent publication. And what's great is both of these resources are informational resources about reading, dyslexia, um, and, and equity. Um, and they all both or both of them have um, professional and very thorough citations that all the information in them can be verified um, for anyone reading them. And they actually both were authored um, in the middle of a pandemic that the collaboration for it occurred over Zoom. Um, one of the big differences is that the guidebook itself is mandated by legislation. Um, it, part of the legislation is that it should be linked on every single school district in the state of Wisconsin right now. Um, so I invite you to check to see if your, your district hasn't linked yet. Um, whereas the roadmap itself is a voluntary um, publication and is completely independent. Um, and so that is two totally different approaches. Dot's got a little bit more to share with you. Well, I think Nancy pretty well said it. Uh, the uh, DPI authored the guidebook and it was mandated by legislation. It had to conform to that legislation. But this roadmap is authored by people who have actually worked with children with dyslexia, who have them in their families, who know what dyslexia is and who understand it. And we hope that it gives a more in-depth picture for parents and teachers and administrators of what can be done to help these kids. Great. Nikki, you want to add anything? I don't think I have anything to add. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. I mean, one thing that I've noticed is that there's this there's a slightly different um, tone to the two uh, the two resources, and um, yeah, you and you can tell that this that the roadmap is is a voluntary effort, really done as as a gift, and um, people working on it being excited to share this information rather than being. Uh, mandated to share information, that, and I think that kind of comes across in the in the tone of the resource. Um, so, well, because it was voluntary, it's also a very fluid publication. Right. Um, so we're able to make updates actually instantaneously. Whereas the roadmap itself, um, by law, or sorry, the guidebook by law will be updated every three years. Um, and those differences actually allowed us as authors of the roadmap to include a lot more depth of information and detail. And so Dot actually has some of that detail to um, highlight for us. Okay. One of the important things that we were able to put into the roadmap was the brain research. And this differs from the guidebook. But if you, you cannot understand dyslexia unless you understand the brain research. What we're showing on the screen right now is a graph of the progression of a typical reader. So at 250 milliseconds, the reader sees the word. At 320 milliseconds, the word connects to meaning and to the speech parts of the brain. And 420 milliseconds, it's put into a broader context. So in less than half a second, an efficient word reader will see and understand the words that they're reading. Now, if you understand this, then let's go to the next slide. The slide on the right is uh, shows the brain of a typical reader. It's graphed a little bit differently, but it shows the same sequence. And then it shows the brain of a dyslexic reader. And you can see that the red part and the yellow part are either very underdeveloped or they're just not present in the brain of a dyslexic reader. And the uh, speech part of the brain uh, is overdeveloped here as they try to compensate. If you do not understand this brain research, 
you tend to think that dyslexia is just another reading problem. It's not. It's very, very different. The processes are different. These kids have to be taught differently. And this is the basis for understanding that. Over on the left side, this also puts dyslexia into a little bit better perspective. By the way, both of these are from Sally Shaywitz, who is a, uh, a pediatric neurologist, and she's at Yale University. And uh, most of this is published through Yale. But you can see here that the dyslexic child has a sea of strengths. And that are often, so the reading problems that occur are often unexpected. They are bright children. They're able to solve problems. They have a solid vocabulary. They can be critical thinkers. They have reasoning abilities. They can form concepts. They can comprehend what they hear. They just cannot comprehend what they read. And their general knowledge is on a par with typically developing readers. So if teachers don't understand this, especially teachers, if they don't understand this, they tend to treat dyslexia as though it's just another reading problem and the kids needs phonics. Well, he needs much more than that. Then we have a printable here that shows the characteristics of dyslexia at different ages that both parents and teachers can print off and look at and see if uh, their child or children or students fit any of these criteria here. Okay, and so on this slide, this is Nikki here now, uh, we just wanted to point out to you that, um, <clears throat> so our, our roadmap <laughs> is able to include multiple models of reading. So in the, in the Wisconsin DPI's guidebook, they present their model, a model representing the reading process, in which we included on, on our site as well. Um, but we wanted to include these other models. Um, since, our, since our website is going to be a fluid document, we can add new information as it is published. And um, you might know there is another model of reading that is just coming out now uh, called the Language Literacy Network. And so we'll have the opportunity to also add that. And what we take the chance to do on our pages is to show you the connections among them. And so in this visual, you can see how, how can you potentially think about this simple view of reading as it connects to the five components of reading instruction um, and then to, uh, to Wisconsin's um, English language, um, uh, English language arts requirements um, and standards. So we try to make these connections for folks so that you can dig in more wherever you are interested or wherever you need to know. Um, we also wanted to point out that for our, for our roadmap, um, we're able to bring in sort of a more national picture of what's going on. The Wisconsin guidebook references Wisconsin's framework for equitable multi-level systems of supports, um, which is a really good document talking about we need to get to equity. We also wanted to look at literacy from that national perspective of through legislation in the last, in the last century, we've seen that there's become a common understanding that the right to literacy is a civil right. Um, and so we're, we've got a section on our page devoted to legislation and trying to help us all understand what are our responsibilities, what are, what are legally our responsibilities to, to our students. Because if we want equity for everyone, we're going to have to focus on equity through literacy. Um, we were also able to include a system perspective and a change management perspective within the roadmap. <clears throat> And um, it definitely is built on the foundation, a shared belief amongst all of the contributors, all nine of the original contributors, and um, Nikki and Dorothy and I, that Wisconsin leaders and parents and teachers can partner together to ensure educational equity and achievement for all learners. But the first step in that is acknowledging our current rea reality. And our current reality is that Wisconsin's um, reading achievement for all students has been declining since 1992. So um, thank you to the Wisconsin Reading Coalition for this wonderful graphic that's on our roadmap. Um, but you can see the red line that since 1992, we've gone from being ranked as the third highest state in reading achievement in the United States 
all the way down to now we're the 27th state. And at the same time, other states that have different legislation, different policies and practices for instruction and intervention and assessment have had different experiences. So you can see that Massachusetts has been able to maintain their ranking with what they do. And that Florida, who has invested um, greatly in uh, the science of reading and structured literacy and uh, consistent statewide assessment practices, you can see that they are experiencing an upward trend. So the great news is we can learn from other states about how to shift that trend in Wisconsin. We also need to recognize that we have had a widening achievement gap in the state of Wisconsin. Um, in 2020, of all the students in Wisconsin in third through eighth grade who took the English language arts forward exam, um, only a total of 33.7% of all Wisconsin students scored proficient on our state uh, reading assessment. Um, of those students, of that third of our students who scored proficient, uh, 43 or 41% of them were white, and whereas only 7.3% were black. We have in our state the largest achievement gap between Caucasian students and African American students of any other state in the United States of America. And that is something that we absolutely need to work together um, to address. Dyslexia is part of that um, equation because dyslexia, dyslexia affects 20% of the population and it affects 80 to 90% of those with learning disabilities. Um, we do note in the roadmap that you will see different estimates of how many people are impacted by dyslexia and that is affected by um, essentially what the um, uh, people describing it use as cut scores, but it's really important to note that Yale University um, through their Connecticut longitudinal study, which followed people from kindergarten through adulthood, and not only did brain scans, but also academic testing all the way through that, identified that 20% or one in five people have dyslexia, yet only 6% are identified and receiving school services for their disability. Equity includes learners with characteristics of dyslexia and dyslexic individuals exist within and across every single demographic that Wisconsin Student Achievement is currently categorized by, whether it's race or socioeconomic status or, or uh, learning disability. And unfortunately, we can't yet fully measure inequities for dyslexic learners because we lack consistent administration and reporting of standardized assessments for word reading accuracy and fluency. So we offer our, this roadmap as a resource to promote equitable, equitable access to learning for all Wisconsin learners, including dyslexic learners, because uh, science shows that 95% of all learners can learn to read at grade level. So on the roadmap on the Equity Through Literacy page, you will find lots of information about Nancy Young's Ladder of Reading and Writing. And she has analyzed um, the scientific research about um, the progression of reading for different types of learners and put it in this wonderful infographic that highlights that all students benefit from structured literacy and some students um, can only learn through structured literacy. We also have a principle on the roadmap um, called the Equity Through Literacy Reflection Tool. And this is a great place to start um, when thinking about uh, the system of a school district and how it is able to um, equitably support um, students within their system. So as people, as they're, as they're looking at the uh, dyslexia roadmap, will notice something unusual about it, and that is it's set up as a website. And if you look at guidebooks, um, guidebooks, handbooks, whatever, in different states, um, the ones I've seen are all documents. And um, this, is, this is kind of a unique approach. And Nancy, I wonder if you could explain what was what was behind the thinking of doing the roadmap as a website and what kind of advantages does that provide? 
So I'm going to actually switch over to the the website in the demonstration for the moment, and. Um, I would say that I, I suggested, I asked the contributors and authors if they would consider a website format as we were getting closer to publishing. And um, part of my reason behind that is that I wasn't diagnosed with dyslexia until I was 43 years old. And so I developed a really high level of compensation strategies. And those compensation strategies involved using text features, uh, needing visuals, um, audio, listening to books, and also searching. Um, so I'm, I'm an expert at control F and a PDF, but most people don't know how to do that. Um, whereas a website itself um, is naturally very searchable. And so um, I happen to have the skills to design a website um, from some previous experiences. And so we ended up uh, choosing to, to do that. And so the roadmap itself um, has really only currently 18 different pages of information, unique pages, um, but they're organized into five different pathways currently. So we have a big picture pathway. That's a great place um, for people to start um, just to get a, a, a high level view of the issues in general. We also have a dyslexia pathway that gets right to the heart of things for our dyslexic learners. Um, then we have a pathway for leaders that we'll be sharing more about later, and then also parents and teachers. Um, but most importantly, and most valuable is probably the search, which is up in the upper right hand corner and looks like a little magnifying glass. And so if I've never heard of the science of reading before, um, I can type that in and hit enter and it searches the roadmap site. And I can see that it is a part of all of these different web pages. And so if I wanna see it in the context of assessment, I can just click on that page and um, I can go from there to continue to learn more. Um, one other pieces that I just like to highlight that are on our homepage is that we are fortunate that we have um, some great organizations like the Reading League tonight um, doing some events to promote us. So we'll always have those up at the top of the homepage. Um, then we have an explanation of what the roadmap is. And then we also have an explanation of some of the consistent sections you'll find in the roadmap. One section that's gray and, and has our picture of a brain is the dyslexia connection section. And these are meant to clarify the relationship between dyslexia and then information about reading and literacy. Um, we also very intentionally linked to and embedded videos and podcasts whenever we could um, to honor the learning needs of our uh, dyslexic view viewers. And so wherever you see the headphone is a list of videos and podcasts, podcasts that could be helpful. And then this is a professional publication. So all the, the citations and references are in APA format at the bottom of each web page. Um, we did go a little bit more loosely with the image citations underneath each image, because it was starting to become a distraction to our viewers, but they are all um, referenced in um, APA format in an image citations um, list at the bottom of every page. And then last, you'll just notice that every single page has links, different text features, extensions, and plugins for various browsers because we wanted people to be able to listen to the content on the roadmap so it was accessible um, to everyone. That's a great uh, overview tour, Nancy. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, so now I think we want to get into looking at some of these tabs that you find up along the top. Um, so Dot, if you are going into this website as a teacher and you go under the teacher tab, what are you likely to find there? What sorts of things? Actually, I'm just going to back up one second, Mary, because okay. I was supposed to share the big picture tab and I didn't. Okay, um, so under the big picture tab, um, again, it just has um, an overview. But one important piece of that that we really wanted to highlight, that's kind of the basis <laughs> for understanding the rest of the roadmap, is an understanding of sight words. And so currently, Wisconsin learners are taught about 50% of the sounds in the English language based on the letters of the alphabet. And then they're encouraged to memorize lists of words. And you know, this is based on what, how most Wisconsin teachers were taught in their teacher preparation programs and in professional development. 
And so um, teachers were taught that sight words were high frequency words or phonetically in irregular words or just words that, that kids were familiar with. That actually conflicts with silent science um, because we now know that the human brain can only memorize 5,000 words. And so that's not an efficient way to become a reader. We can, however, memorize all 44 sounds that are in the English language and multiple letter combinations that make those sounds. And then we can learn the process for linking pronunciations and spellings and meanings of words through a process that's called orthographic mapping. And that's what wires the brain to decode automatically. So for the purposes of the roadmap to really understand what's in it, we need to use the definition of sight words that researchers use, which is a word that um, is firmly embedded in the memory system and can be automatically recognized upon sight um, because it's been wired in the brain through connecting sound, spelling, and meaning. Um, and it has nothing to do with whether or not that word is a high frequency word or low frequency or phonetically regular or irregular. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dot for the teacher section. Okay, thank you. In the teacher section, we tried to explain in different words exactly what dyslexia is. Uh, this is Hugh Katz, who's a very well-known researcher in the field, who took the, uh, um, uh, I just lost the word, uh, Nancy, feel took free this, to fill. He took the simple view and put uh, it in. Thank you, Mary, thank you. Yeah, the simple view of reading. And he put into this graph so that teachers can understand this easily. And you'll see in the uh, top left quadrant where it says strong language comprehension and weak decoding. This is the typical profile for a dyslexic reader. Look uh, down, weak language, oh, no, I wanted to go through this just a little more. Uh, weak language comprehension and weak decoding, um, uh, multiple problems there. Strong language comprehension, strong decoding, that's what we'd like every reader to be able to do. Weak language comprehension with strong decoding uh, defines a hyperlexic child who can call out the words, but the comprehension isn't there. So we try to explain this. Then the other, another point that's critically important, we use uh, Mark Seidenberg's model here. And Mark Seidenberg is at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, this four-part processor. And I really want to emphasize the word processor because many teachers think that phonological awareness is the same as phonological processing, and it's not. And unless you understand the fluidity of the brain processes and how they interact with each other, you will not understand dyslexia. This system, back up just one minute, the meaning, the spelling, and the sound have to be, have to form an efficient network for a child to be an efficient reader, and teachers need to understand that. Okay, we'll flip through the others fast. Uh, Nadine Gobb, who's at Harvard, a researcher in dyslexia, very well known, has talked about the importance of early screening. Well, if you understand the brain research, you understand that it's critical to identify these kids as early as we can. And we can actually uh, understand the uh, uh, brain processes that are behind dyslexia as early as age four. We can't diagnose dyslexia until they start to read, but we can identify the kids that are at risk. Now, the other thing that uh, we're trying to do is to dispel some false notions that are out there that teachers seem to have. They seem to think that structured literacy means phonics only. That is as wrong as it can be. I have two degrees in English. I love literature. I love poetry. I love to read. And structured literacy includes everything that's important to an enthusiastic reader, even motivation. And so we use the IDA chart 
uh, that was created to explain this, that you teach phonology, you teach sound symbol, you teach syllables, you teach morphology, you teach syntax, you teach syntax, uh, semantics and syntax, but you do it in a systematic, cumulative, explicit way. And the teacher should be able to jump into that circle at any point, diagnose exactly what the child's problem is, and give him the kind of instruction that will help him through it. So I, if, if we're short on, oh, yeah, we do want to mention this. We also provided materials for the teachers to begin immediate skills assessment. As Nancy mentioned, uh, most teachers base their uh, assessments on standards to really understand dyslexia and to really teach these kids they have to shift to a skills-based kind of assessment so we included some from really great reading that are free the teachers can jump in right away and uh, start to understand how to do this so they can pinpoint the issues here more free stuff. We tried to provide all the free stuff we could for teachers because to get uh, the comprehensive training can be expensive. Not all districts pay for it, but there's a lot of free stuff out there that teachers can access that will help them understand. So this, I think we are moving over to Nikki now. Um, and again, if you were on the um, the homepage of the website, you'd see not only that tab for teachers, but you'd see a tab for parents. And you, you see some of the some of the same pages pop up under parents as popped up under big picture or under teachers. So regardless of where you come in from, you're going to hit uh, the points that are important to you. Nikki, do you want to just um, buzz through a few of these? Yeah, sure. Um, so We've got this um, educate yourself is kind of the first part of what shows up on the parent page, because this, this is a lot from my experience. So when I realized my son was having trouble, I wanted to be able to fix it. So um, some of these resources are ones that I used. And again, on this topic of free resources, there are a lot of free resources out there. Um, there are decodable books that you can use. There are explanations of how this works, how to get to what do all the letters mean? Because again, since I learned to read by myself with my mom's help just reading the words, I didn't have it all. I didn't know it all. I didn't know that EA could say E or A. I just, I knew it inside, but I couldn't have articulated that. And for my child who has dyslexia, I needed to be able to articulate that. He's in third grade now reading well, and we're still reminding each other about what sounds each of those letter groups make. Um, so we've highlighted our list here. So the Reading League has a wonderful list of decodable text sources. And when I say decodable text, what I'm talking about is books that limit which words they use to just exact formulations of our letters. So Bob books is an easy example to use. They've their first small books that come out um, and a lot of these are available at the public libraries, which has been wonderful. Um, the smallest books are just like Matt, Sat, Pat. So you get the short A sound. But then as you teach your child more sounds and, and symbol correspondences, then you move up through the Bob book series and you can actually support your child by using a set of decodables. For some kids, that's enough to get them jump started. For other kids, they'll need more um, in-depth exposure. If you want to flip to the next page, because you know, another thing we wanted to show you was, okay, parents, you you might be wondering, oh, my kid is, is a little bit slow to pick up on reading. Well, we wanted to give you access to, to some of these ideas about how you can identify dyslexia. Um, and it is not easy necessarily um, in Wisconsin as a parent to figure out how to navigate the system. Uh, if your kids are in school, um, how do I get my child identified as dyslexic? Do I need to go? Do I need to go to the doctor's office? Do I need to go to a neuropsych? Can the school do it? Um, and so this whole website is meant to be a support for the teachers, for districts, and for you. And so we link out for you to some assessments that are free that your school 
could do if they have someone there who has the correct credentials. There are folks at schools who can do these, these primary assessments. The Woodcock Johnson and the Wexler Individual Achievement Test are two of them. Um, and but some and obviously some the medical professionals who also can do these tests. So uh, we have a group in Wisconsin called Decoding Dyslexia Wisconsin, and we have links in our parent section too for how to join with a group of parents who will be able to help you with your questions too and support you as you navigate the process if you do have a child who you think might have dyslexia. I think that's really important that uh, Decoding Dyslexia is a great group too. Um, to link up with, um, it, it'll help parents a lot. Nancy, we're gonna flip back to you if you can just show us quickly what's under that leader's navigation menu. Yep, absolutely. So one of the things that's under the leader's navigation menu is um, some information about legislation that has to do with literacy and, and dyslexia. And it's really important to know that um, dyslexia is actually defined in federal law it is also defined in Wisconsin law because it's defined in Act 86. And it's also important to know that Wisconsin was the 43rd state to pass dyslexia legislation. So when we look at this map here that's on the screen, this happens to be a map of uh, states which have screening uh, legislation related to literacy and, and, and reading and dyslexia. Um, <laughs> Uh, Wisconsin is darker blue because we have Act 86 and in the informational guidebooks. So we have some legislation, but the, the medium blue states are all states that actually have um, legislation requiring early screening. And so you can see that Wisconsin is surrounded by states that have legislation requiring that. And that's really important to know. I, work, I live on the west side of the, uh, the um, state, um, right on the border of Minnesota. And when we realized that our children were struggling with dyslexia, one of the options that we considered was actually moving, selling our house and moving 20 minutes across the border because we knew that our, our children would have better um, supports by legislation just 15 minutes away. It's also important to know that there is legislation that's currently, um, uh, Governor Evers could be looking at it because on January 11th, uh, 2022, Senator Bernier and Representative Kitchens uh, reintroduced an amendment so the Roadmap Reading Success Bill, which uh, Assembly Amendment 2, um, and this would um, support the, the screening that is needed in Wisconsin. And um, it's important to know that it actually is funded because it's funded by a state law, um, 118.106. And the, that's been in the state budget for years and the funding hasn't fully been claimed. Um, and this bill has already been approved by the Senate and the Assembly, so it really is just waiting for Governor Evers to act on it. So we could um, become a state that has this first really important step to addressing this need. Um, it's also really important to understand the difference between types of reading assessments for anyone, um, particularly for parents. You might get a report home that gives a level of uh, A, B, C, D, or F. Um, those type of reading assessments only have a 54% diagnostic accuracy. So it's like flipping a coin as to determining whether or not uh, your child is at risk for reading struggles or not. Uh, other common ones that are, or, that are used by school districts are standards-based assessments. Those give feedback like um, you should practice main idea more or practice inferencing or read more nonfiction text. And those are very useful if you're a skilled reader. If um, early on, before kids have developed the foundational reading skills, uh, skill-based assessments are also needed. And so we've got some great handouts about the types of assessments and then also examples of diagnostic and progress monitoring reading assessments. And so many of them are free that teachers could start using right away and that parents can use at home. Other ones are paid for and it's useful to know about them so that you can be using them accurately in your districts. It's also essential that everyone understands that standards-based uh, skill or assessments can be used, but that uni or universal skills-based assessments are the most appropriate and defensible tool for identifying students that have skill deficits 
um, and are in need of reading intervention. And so if a skills-based universal screener is not used, then districts are at, they're vulnerable to being at risk of violating child find. And so we have a lot of school districts in the state of Wisconsin that are not currently consistently using skill-based um, screeners. And so they are not identifying all the students that are in need of intervention matched to their foundational reading skill deficits and matching them with the correct intervention and potentially identifying them for special education needs as needed. Um, curriculum is also extremely important. Um, there's a new partnership with uh, UW-Madison uh, that's working to map all the curriculums used in the state of Wisconsin. And so you can find a link to this right on our curriculum page and you can actually search up your district and find out what curriculum they're using. Uh, the most common curriculums in Wisconsin are balanced literacy curriculums. Um, the most common ones that you might hear are Fontas and Pinnell and Lucy Calkins. Um, the challenge with this is that these particular curriculums have a very low effect size on the research. And so Hattie um, has basically done a meta-analysis of all the, all the research that's been done on instruction and reading. And he's identified that um, one year's growth or the impact of um, being at school with a teacher is uh, labeled as a 0.4 effect size. And so in the state of Wisconsin, we need to use instructional practices that are 0.4 to 1.6 because we need to accelerate growth. We need to get more than one year's growth out of one year's school. Well, unfortunately, balanced literacy has a 0.09 effect size, which means that we're with balanced literacy, you get essentially 25% of a year's schooling or growth or one quarter or one term out of one full year of school. And so it completely explains why we have a downward trend in, uh, in, in reading achievement in Wisconsin. And that absolutely is something that we need to address as soon as possible in order to, to change our trend. Um, another really important page under the leadership, leadership section is the costs and the return on investment of addressing uh, our literacy struggles in Wisconsin and particularly dyslexia. It's really important to know that this has been studied in other states and there's a really great white paper from California that highlights that um, dyslexia is one of the most prevalent learning issues facing school aged children. It's almost as large as ESL, it's larger than ADHD, it's larger than diagnosed behavioral problems, anxiety, PTSD, depression, and autism. So school districts are spending a lot of money on mental health. And in all reality, we need to invest in reading and literacy and dyslexia so that we have fewer mental health problems. Um, and dyslexia is actually a larger problem than, than some of the issues that we're investing in. Um, the California White Paper also highlights that the dyslexic learners are overrepresented in negative life outcomes. So dyslexic learners have a higher incidence of chronic, chronic absenteeism, of needing social services, juvenile detention, a higher incidence rate in special education, also in prisons. So 80% of prison inmates are illiterate and 48% of those are dyslexic. Uh, there also is a higher incidence rate in homelessness of people who are dyslexic. So long-term, our school districts need to start addressing this problem because it will benefit our society. Uh, the California White Paper also identified a really amazing statistic that if they invest in early literacy screening and teacher training and assistive technology, they can unlock 5% of their entire state budget. I can't even imagine what we could do with 5% of the Wisconsin state budget. There's also a really great um, straight out of the Ohio um, uh, roadmap, which is what the Wisconsin roadmap is based off of. Uh, there's a school district in Ohio that started in implementing structured literacy and did a, an ROI study. And they discovered that they could have realistic savings in 25 years for this one school district of $12 million. I can't imagine what my local school district or I as a school board member, what we could have done in our district with $12 million over 25 years. We could make a big difference in a lot of different ways. 
Um, there are lots of lessons learned. I'm not going to go into that right now, but I just wanted to highlight that on that same cost and ROI page, there are um, some wonderful webinars actually hosted by the um, Reading League of Wisconsin, Wisconsin. where um, dis district leaders are discussing their journeys into the science of reading right here in the state of Wisconsin. So there's a lot of opportunity to learn about what we're doing here already. Um, and there's also great resources about on our building capacity page and our continuous learning page. So, um, and the building capacity page, um, lots of change management stuff. We also highlight that there's a lot of accredited training options, both through the Center of Effective Reading Instruction and through the IDA. Um, also, the DPI has a really great um, uh, listing of uh, suggestions for spending on professional development aligned to quality curriculum resources. Um, there's also the knowledge and practice standards from the IDA, which any training, whether it's a half an hour webinar uh, that's free or a full accredited training should be aligned to these standards. Uh, we also link to all the literacy organizations in Wisconsin who support the science of reading because they have a plethora of resources just on their um, websites. And if you haven't dug into the science of reading on social media yet, um, it's life changing. <laughs> you can learn a great deal there. Thank you, Nancy. Dorothy, can you just tell people um, what are the plans for this roadmap um, moving into the future? And, um, you know, Nancy had said earlier, this is a living website that yes. can be changed, yes. uh, you know, and so What's the, going to be the process for adding and adding to and revising the roadmap in the future? Well, because it's so fluid, we will be able to stay up with the latest research. For instance, the new uh, literacy network that includes writing as part as part of the complete literacy picture uh, has just been published. We plan to add that. We plan to add material about writing, about how to help ESL kids, about co-occurring conditions with dyslexia, anything that's out there. There are many issues that we're uh, debating and tackling, and we invite contributors. If you've got time or if you're passionate about something, as Nikki would say, uh, write something up, put it in APA format <laughs> so she doesn't have to, <laughs> and send it Thanks, to Dad. us. Thanks, Dad. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> send it to us because we're happy to consider other viewpoints. We're wide open. We don't have uh, an agenda. We just want to help the kids and the people in Wisconsin. And so how, um, how do people um, reach the, the roadmap um, governing group in order to contribute or to ask questions or make suggestions? How do they reach you? Well, you'll see that our email link is at the bottom of every page on the roadmap. So if you just scroll down to the bottom of whichever page you happen to be on, we've got an email address that um, that just comes up if you click the little email button. Your your email browser should bring it up. Mm -hmm. Mary. And we have to say thank you to all the literacy organizations in the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, the task force was very generous in promoting the roadmap at an exhibit booth at the 2022 State Education Convention last week. We're very grateful to the Reading League for hosting this webinar tonight. Um, we have an upcoming webinar with Decoding Dyslexia, and um, I believe IDA has contacted us mm -hmm. to schedule one also. And so we would like to focus on authoring new content and not have to focus on promoting the roadmap. And so we're very grateful to these literacy organizations for um, partnering with us for these promotional events uh, currently to help us get launched. Great. And so anybody, anybody who's watching too, you know, feel free to pass the link to the website on when people ask you a question about where can I get info on this? So here's a good resource uh, that's brand new. Try it out. Um, I'm looking at the chat. I just want, um, there is one question. I'm just going to do that in a second. I want to let people know that I did put the link in the chat box um, to request a certificate of attendance if you need that. And Reading League of Wisconsin has 
um, three events coming up that I put some put links to in here. Um, on February 15th, we have uh, Dr. Robert Newby, who's a pediatric neuropsychologist, and he's going to be talking about um, evaluations for reading disabilities. And then on March 8th, we have as a guest Robert Meyer, who's going to be talking about emerging research in uh, early alphabet instruction. And then on October 7th, we have, I know it's a ways off, but this is big in our minds. We're um, hosting a conference with uh, national level speakers that's gonna be held in Brookfield and it'll be both in-person and, um, and live stream options for that. So anyway, I put links on there so people can um, get more information. Now, Amy had a question and I'm gonna open this up to the three of you. Um, what are teacher ed programs doing to revamp their curriculum to address the need to incorporate science of reading into their curriculum? Dorothy, stop laughing. Uh, unless, te unless teachers are graduating with knowledge of how reading develops, what effective reading instruction looks like and how to intervene when there are difficulties, this issue will continue to be like the tail wagging the dog. What have you heard from Wisconsin colleges and universities? And of course, this oh. is... This is the main issue that many of us have yeah. been working on for yeah. well over a decade, two decades. And yeah. um, so personally, I haven't, um, well, there are some, there are some bright spots. <laughs> and, uh, there, there, there are. Yeah, Carroll University has a program. UW-Whitewater has a new program. So there are some, mm -hmm. there are some things out there. Um, that are available, but um, as far as just your basic undergrad teacher preparation programs, I, you know, it's a problem. Dorothy, you have something to add yeah. to that? Oh yeah, you okay. have shut me off on this one. Okay, we're, we're, yeah, a, little, we're, we're a little over our time, okay. so just keep it brief. Okay, I'll, I'll keep it brief. There are two major problems. Uh, reading professors don't read the brain research and they read other reading experts who also don't read the brain research. That's one problem. Another comment that I've heard is, oh, that's linguistics. We don't teach linguistics. Well, I'm sorry, you cannot teach a child to read in the English language unless you understand the English language. So there are some attitudes that need to change. I do think they are, as Mary said, there are some bright spots out there that are starting to change. They're mainly with the smaller colleges. They have more flexibility. They can move faster. They don't have as many people who have to agree on the curriculum as yeah. the larger colleges do. But you're right, Amy, that's a huge problem. It's at the root of a lot of our, of the problems that we have in Wisconsin and, you know, so. Can uh, I just add to that? Yes. Um, so I'd just like to add that I had a friend who works in who works in medicine who talked about the fact that there's research that it takes 30 years for a new medical discovery to be consistently used in the patient visit room. It takes that long for something new in a field to be consistently used in, in that field. And that's a field that has access by their profession to all the updated resources. Um, I'm a Wisconsin trained teacher and administrator, and I didn't learn any of this in my Wisconsin training. And then in my professional career, I didn't have access to the journals to learn it regularly either. And so, so we definitely have some shifting to do. It's a global world and, and all of our professions are adapting to it. And so there's no doubt that, that we have some shifting to do in higher ed probably in all fields, mm -hmm. and that we're retooling all professions with on-the-job training. Um, but I'm confident that our parents and our teachers and our administrators in Wisconsin and the higher ed can do this, and that they'll partner together to do it, just like every other profession is, because it's the right thing to do. And so the other thing that I'll just close with is when, I, when you start learning these things, it triggers the grief process because uh, I trusted and loved and was grateful for all of my academic training in Wisconsin. And I have had unbelievable professional learning opportunities in my career. Districts have invested a great deal in me and it didn't teach me this information. 
And so that definitely triggers strong emotions in the grief process. And so please be kind to teachers who are just discovering this. And teachers, please be kind to yourselves as you learn this, because we can part to get, partner together and address uh, the challenges that Wisconsin's facing right now. Yeah, we had a, a second you. question that was basically basically the same as the first. Why would UW School of Education, which persists in teaching balanced reading, be such an impediment to literacy after all these years? And you know, as you know, we've kind of discussed that. And then um, Christy asked, what can parents do to help their district see that change needs to happen? Our district, Christie's district, is looking at new curriculum and it is not following the science of reading. What can what can parents do um, to advocate for improvements in their districts? Ideas? Step, step one is share the roadmap mm -hmm. because there's a lot of information about that on there. And then step two is pay attention, go to the board meetings, listen to them online, and um, hold districts accountable to spending tax dollars on evidence-based practices. Yeah, I think you just, uh, parents have a lot of power when they start to speak up, especially if they, if it starts with just one person, but if it builds into a group, uh, there's more power there. Districts are sensitive to uh, what parents are saying and, and more so if parents are organized um, and mm -hmm. speak with a unified voice. So. Um, your school boards are going to, they're important to go to those meetings, write letters, um, ask to speak. Um, those are all important things. And then on your, uh, you know, you volunteer. I know when our district was selecting uh, new reading programs, uh, this was almost 15, 20 years ago. I just, I called up the director of curriculum instruction and I offered to come out and look through them and give my opinions. And they, they were open, not that they chose the one that I would have preferred. And there weren't a lot of good choices in there. But, um, you know, sometimes it just takes, uh, it takes more reaching out than, than, than we think is necessary. It's the parents need to um, carry a heavier load than perhaps they had anticipated. Um, when it well, and because of time, Mary, I skipped over some information about ESSER funding. Um, but now is a great time to pay attention to what's going on in your district, because there are large opportunities for districts to choose to spend ESSER funding on curriculum resources, on professional development, and on assessments that um, can and should be aligned to the science of reading and evidence-based practices. Yeah, very important. Um, okay, I, we've exceeded our time a little bit. Mary, I, Mary. Yes, yes, Dorothy. I'm going to embarrass you, and I apologize in advance, but I want to thank you personally for your leadership in the state of Wisconsin with the reading issues that are here. When I moved back from Ohio, a, a very famous reading specialist told me to look you up and find you. We could not have done this roadmap without you, and I want you to know how much we appreciate you and everything you have done. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dorothy. And uh, yeah, a lot of us have been at this for a long time and uh, it's good to see more people joining. I, I do sense that there is, uh, there, we're kind of gathering a critical mass of people that's yeah. gonna be necessary to actually, um, uh, to enact some change rather. For a lot of years, I felt like I was banging my head against a wall. But I do yeah. feel like there are um, areas um, uh, that are possible for change here. So anyway, um, I want to thank everybody. Thank, uh, thanks to Dorothy and Nikki and Nancy for uh, working on this, for sharing it with us tonight, for continuing the work on into the future. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. And with that, we will just say good night and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.